welcome to our book talk with Janet Wallet, the author of The Richest Woman in America, Hetty Green and the Gilded Age. We had a lecture, lecture last week, um, which was very informative, and you can catch it on YouTube for those of you who missed it. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more about the book today, um, get a little bit deeper into Hetty's psychology, um, and just talk a little bit more about Hetty and Hoboken, actually. Um, you know, Janet, when, when I was reading the book, I kind of felt like there was this, like there were two Hetty's, and Hetty who had loved business and she lived to do that. But then there was the Hetty who told a reporter, I hate business. I just attend to it for my children's sake. I would a great deal rather be a society woman. And she could have been that, you know, and she was very good friends with Countess Leary, who was in fact a society woman. I, I would agree with you that she felt a burden to make sure that her children had as much or more money than she had. That was the major lesson that her father taught her, to protect and increase the family wealth and to leave it to her children. So yes, she was probably uh, weighted down by that. But at the same time, she loved business. And I think very often you had to take what she said with a grain of salt or maybe two grains of salt. Um, she was a character, we can't forget that. Uh, and, and she, but she did love business. It was always the, the, where she wanted to be, what she wanted to be doing, how she spent her time. And given a choice, it was always Wall Street or the railroads or whatever was connected to business matters. She loved it. Well, it's interesting because thinking of her, you know, she was in the same category as the Astors and the Vanderbilts and, you know, all those extremely wealthy families back then. It's kind of hard to think of Hetty. I mean, she was, she was intelligent and she was a good conversation. She liked to dance. It's hard to think of her sitting down to society lunches and she, what is she going to talk about with these women who don't have that much to do with their, they're, I mean, they're not active every day out there in the business world like Hetty was. Hardly. Uh, that, that would have been the most tedious, most boring uh, experience for her, would have been, to have been at a society lunch. She did love having lunch in the inexpensive restaurants down on Wall Street where she could talk to people and find out what was really going on with the common man. Um, that she enjoyed. And she enjoyed having lunch with some of the other bankers, some of the major bankers in, in New York. Uh, she was very good at sharing information with them, or even better at gaining information from them. They admired her, they respected her. Uh, a number of, of major figures on Wall Street thought very highly of her tremendous respect for her abilities and so they were the people she wanted to spend her time with they were the ones that she had most in common with um and she liked her house in bellows falls because at one point she was sort of boasting about growing all their own vegetables and uh they only ate their own turkeys that they found on the farm and it was kind of again interesting to think of her um growing her own vegetables and, and doing all that while society ladies, you know, were down in New York, you know, getting decked out by Parisian designers. Yes, that was certainly not her interest. She, you know, she did enjoy being in the country. Uh, she came from a small town. It wasn't a farming town. It was a whaling town, New Bedford, Massachusetts. But she did enjoy it. She, she liked the air, she liked the atmosphere, and she had some very good friends there too. And it sounded like she could relax. Like I she can't relax. hear you, sorry. Like she could relax there. Yes, she could. Yes, she could. Um, Although once in a while she had to hide from the reporters because they were often on her trail. And it was a problem for her. She, she saw it that way. And, 
it, the funny thing is that when she did like a reporter and give him time, and it was always a he, not a she, um, they admired her and they wrote wonderful stories about her. Those aren't the ones that were remembered, but as I went through hundreds, maybe thousands of newspaper stories about her, it was, it was wonderful to see that there were some, some articles that really got close to her. Reporters who got to know her very well, not just standing back in her outfit, her dress, but, but really talking with her, engaging with her. And um, she came across as a very different, far more sympathetic woman than we think of. Yeah, she, she kind of you know, was a victim of this um, image of her as dirty and miserly. And, you know, she, she was a little of those things, but she wasn't all those things. But, you know, it's funny because she was really famous in her time. And I, I don't know if we realize it or not, but she was, she was, um, I mean, talked about in, in, um, caricatured in magazines as, you know, a, a pauper. Here she is with uh, George Gould and Russell Sage. Um, here she is in, in some imaginary Roosevelt cabinet of millionaires. You always see her. She's always on a level with John D. Rockefeller and J.P. Morgan and Andrew Carnegie. And she was that famous and in that company, you know, considered in that company. Yes, she was. She was. Um, I'm sorry. This is this is the cabinet. Sorry about that. Um, here's J. Yeah. D. Rockefeller, J. D. Rockefeller, J. P. Morgan, Andrew Carnegie, Petty. That's that's Russell Sage peeling her an apple. Yes, she was. She was in that category. There's no question about it. Uh, and they did count on her for. Um, money for, for example, for New York City. Um, it says she she stepped in she went to New York City uh, a lot of money at very good rates, actually. Yes, she did. And she was the largest bond, la largest bond holder that the city had. So she was the, the, the biggest financier, you might say, for New York City. Uh, so she was very important. And remember, too, that when she was dressed in those long black outfits that we that we sometimes see her pictured in she was walking around wall street when the mode of transportation was horses this there, there weren't uh, weren't wide side well, there still aren't wide sidewalks on wall street and there was a lot of filth in the streets so uh, she was being practical. She wasn't going to walk around in fancy light colored dresses. That didn't make any sense at all. Mm -hmm. So, so she, she really got a bad rap. <laughs> I think that's the way to put it. Uh, yes, she was miserly. But when we think about today, so is Warren Buffett. No, he lives in the same house that he did, I believe, from the 1950s. He still eats his lunch in a in a small coffee shop downtown. Uh, and what does he have? And it's not filet mignon, it's uh, hamburgers and Cokes. So and nobody, nobody thinks of him as really miserly because he does have a terrific sense of humor and he does show a great deal of warmth. He is a very warm man. Hetty was not. She was more fearful than, than Warren Buffett. She was afraid of people wanting her money. And they were always after her for her money. So she had a very different kind of personality. Hetty didn't seem like she suffered fools gladly. No, she did not. She did not. She had no time to waste on fools. Um, well, we do have a question here from one of our um, guests today. Um, Melissa asks, uh, she wants to know about your source material and the research you did for the book and how long did it take? I spent about two and a half years on the book, maybe three. And I unfortunately, I could not find the kinds of things that biographers love, which is diaries and journals and letters. There were, however, an enormous 
number of newspaper articles and magazine articles. And so I really did a pretty thorough reading of those, of those stories. And then of course I used books about people from that period and history books from that period. Uh, and um, anything that I could find that related to her. What do you think happened to her? I mean, she must have left tons of letters behind and things like that, how personal they were, not business oriented, but what do you think happened to them? I don't think she did write a lot of letters. I think she was worried. You know, she was engaged in a tremendous lawsuit uh, against her aunt's estate. And she was accused of forging her aunt's signature. So she was very wary of writing things mm. and, and, her, and her signature being copied. She did not send a lot of letters. There just weren't, they just, they weren't out there, uh, unfortunately. And she certainly never kept diaries. Um, that's interesting because I'm, I'm, I'm trying, I'm doing our talk on Martha and Caroline Stevens, and they were women who accomplished a lot in their lifetime, and there's no primary sources for that. So it's kind of women's voices missing from history. That's what our series is all about. Well, let's yes. get back to Hetty, because I wanted to talk about Sylvia. Sylvia was six feet tall. She was really tall. Yes. And when I was reading about, um, you know, Countess Leary's uh, uh, efforts to launch her into society and find her a husband, because Hetty made it very difficult for her children to get married. I was wondering, you know, gee, I wonder why she didn't um, get a title, get a British title. She had so much money, she could have bought a duke or a Money, you know. Oh, but that was exactly what Hetty did not want. She, in fact, she told her daughter she'd rather have her marrying a working class fellow who spent his time at work earning a, earning a living than somebody who was going to live off of Sylvia's money. And, and that's exactly what happened when, when all those Gilded Age marriages combined a title uh, with, on, on the one hand, with the large amounts of money, American money on the other. And she did have one or two men who were after her who had titles and Hetty just tore them apart and threw them out the door practically before Sylvia could get anywhere near the wedding aisle. But she did, in the end, marry a man from one of the great families. He was an Astor, Matthew Astor Wilkes. He, he was a cousin, a distant cousin. And so not from the heart of the family, one could say, but he had a great deal of, of, of wealth and um, education and all, all of the things that, that were, were considered proper. And, and she must have liked him because she left him money in her will. Yes. Yes, she did. And she also was quite generous in her will. I just realized uh, the other day, she lived on Fifth Avenue and 80th Street in Manhattan, Sylvia did. And the building is still there. And just down the street was the New York Society Library. She left the library $600,000. That's a lot of money. So uh, she, was, she was generous. And, and interesting that it was a library that she left so much money to. Um, we have another question here. Um, Melissa wants to know, did she get involved with any boards of directors? Did she influence the selection of directors? Um, I think you're probably meaning, are you meaning private boards of directors, Melissa, public boards of directors, not-for-profits? Um, you know, did she serve on those kind of things because wealthy men did? The boards that she served on were mostly the railroads that she was, that she was invested in. And um, Ned was one of the people who was, who was on them. Her husband was on them. Uh, so it was her very close circle and her family. Those were the kinds of boards. Did she serve on philanthropic boards? Absolutely not. 
She didn't want anybody to, to think of her in those terms, even though she did give money to philanthropic causes, particularly the causes that her friend, Annie Leary, who was a great philanthropist, encouraged her to donate to, and her son, Ned, who, who uh, got her to admit, it got her to uh, give money to a medical cause. I, mean, I think, um, I'm trying to remember if it was a hospital, or it was something to care for actors. And, uh, and, oh. I went, was it the place in Englewood? Yeah, I thought I remembered something about that. Well, there was that, yes, which became a home for actors right. after, after she died, yes. And there were a few other things like that because Ned was very, very involved with the theater. His, his longtime girlfriend who became his wife was a showgirl. Mabel Hart. And, uh, he was a stage door Johnny. So he, yes, he was interested in that, that world, if you will. Now, um, did any guide him away from politics because there wasn't enough money in it? Or was she was involved in politics in Texas, right? He was involved with politics in Texas, and he had hoped that he would get some kind of big appointment from McKinley when McKinley became oh. president, because they gave they gave a lot of money to the Republican Party at that time, and um, and. As happens today, they they were hoping for, or Ned was hoping for a, a big position, maybe as a diplomat, an ambassador, or in the in the government. But then Hetty said, "You cannot be in the government and in business. There's just not enough time to do both, and you won't be doing either one right." And so she put the kibosh on that idea. And it's true but that they both take up an enormous amount of time. And she felt that Ned, like, like her, had a big responsibility to keep the, the family interest, the money interest. Yes. Um, well, you know, I mean, she was, she was lived to be quite a good old age, Hattie. I think she was 80. Isn't she 80 when she died? Yes, she was. Yes. 80 and, um, we're going to look at her obit right now. Let me, let me pull this up. Um, jump in here. Um, uh, whoops. There it is. There's her obit. Um, and we're going to notice that her last address before she went to live with Ned at the end of her years and she lived at, with Ned at 5 West 90th Street. Yes. Before she lived there, she lived at 1233 Bloomfield. So that must have been, and we don't know if she owned it or not. She may have just been renting it. Um, but you know, you mentioned in the book that she lived in the, the yellow flats on 12th and Washington. She went back there. She wanted that same apartment. She couldn't get it. So she moved around the corner on Bloomfield and this is where uh, she, that was her last a hundred million. Oh, she, she liked living in, she liked living in Hoboken. She liked Hoboken. It was, she liked it was, yes, it was very, first of all, it was very convenient to Wall Street. She could take the ferry. Uh, and it was kind of like a small town, and it still has a bit of that flavor today. And she was as you know, she she liked the the local people. She wasn't interested, but except for Annie Leary and maybe one or two other people, she really wasn't interested in socializing with the big names and the, and the ultra rich. She, she had, wanted to she help people. She wanted to be with real people uh, who, were, who would like her for herself. And Hoboken was a wonderful place to do that. And it had, in a way, like Brooklyn Heights, the other place that she spent much of her time in. They were on the water. That reminded her of her childhood in, in New Bedford. Mm -hmm. you know, and you could smell the water and the waterfront and the and there was a sense of going out to sea, if you used your imagination. Uh, and I think she enjoyed all of that. 
So I, I, she much preferred living in Hoboken to living in Manhattan. Okay, well, if we don't, don't have any more questions, um, Jenna, thank you so much for doing this for us. We've had such a deep dive into Hetty. I feel so differently about Hetty now. And I feel like Hetty should be getting a lot more respect. Yeah. Because her story is relevant to today. You know, she exactly. knows about women should be educated about business and it's still very relevant. It's very relevant, and so is her wariness of the markets when they go zooming out. <laughs> I shouldn't use <keep> zooming <laughs> when they climb skyward. When they go she, up and down, um, and she was very smart to be um, weary of the media. She seemed to want to be in control of the media, and she was to a very large extent. Yes, she was. Yes, she was. Yeah. So this has been great. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. And um, sure. we'll talk later. And everybody, thank you for joining us. I'm just going to show you this one other thing. Um, we're going to uh, we're going to have next week's talk is going to be um, on Millicent Fenwick, and it's going to be Amy Shapiro. And uh, for those of you who don't know, Millicent Fenwick was a member of the Stevens family. So we're going to hear about that. And I think we may even hear from Millicent Fenwick's grandson, great, uh, grandson and great grandson. So I hope you'll join us. If you haven't registered, you can do it right here at the New Jersey Women Make History link. And um, Janet, again, thank you so much. And thank um, you. see everybody next week. Thank you all. Thank you, Janet, again.